Hello everyone, ladies, gentlemen, gentle dems, gentle fluids, gentle beings, and however else you may happen to identify. I am Rustam, the hero of the Persian Empire, reborn in the modern day to battle evil on the internet. <laughs> being, uh, being softer is affecting my memory. I guess I'm a bit used to being more animated with my intro for gaming streams and whatnot. Hmm, that's, uh, anyways, welcome to the new Persian Empire. Today, our battlefield is on the field of sleep. Today, we battle against insomnia. A most fearsome and treacherous opponent indeed, but not invincible. Today we are going to fight off insomnia, as well as all the sleep paralysis demons and demons in general, through the power of the good book. And no, I'm not talking about the Bible. Today we're going to be using something a bit different from that. Uh, but first, I think I might need to uh, do something about this. Hold on a moment. Okay, there we go. I think uh, that should work a bit better. There we go. Gotta make the microphone a bit less sensitive. I really ought to figure out a cure for the back little bit of background noise that is my AC, but I don't know. For today's stream, maybe it'll help relax. I don't know. I'll uh I'll later look into getting some filters installed or whatever I need to do. Meantime, the book we're going to be reading is the Shalnameh, written by Ferdowsi, the ancient Zoroastrian Parsi poet. The Shalnameh is to Persian culture what stories of, say, Hercules and Perseus and whatnot were to the Greeks. The Shahnameh is the big book of Persian myths, so to speak. And so today, we're going to be reading it. Or at least a translation of it. Alright, now let me just find... Do, do, do. Okay. I could start with uh, the. I could start with the dedicatory page, or the foreword, or the preface, or the introduction. But those are honestly really long, and really wordy. I honestly don't really feel like doing that. I feel like reading some actual stories. So, I think we'll start with page one, In Praise of Holy God, which uh, for Zoroastrians, God is Ahura Mazda. Oh, now, those who aren't Zoroastrians, I will ask you to bear with us. I know that this might be, you know, a little bit blasphemous, perhaps, but please do bear with us. After all, Zoroastrianism is quite the valid religion, as far as I know it. So, I hope that you will keep an open mind and see if there's something you can take away from Zoroastrianism. Alright, here we are. Shaname of Fardusi. Chapter 1. 
in praise of holy God. In the name of the Lord of life and wisdom, the Lord of name and place, the Lord who guides along the path of righteousness, the Lord of the universe and the revolving planets, the Lord who gives light to the sun, moon, and the stars. Goodness, that was a rather loud, uh, at least for me, a rather loud raid noise. This is why I muted the desktop audio. I do hope that no one wa had their ears blown open by that. In any case, it seems we have raiders. Hello, raiders. Hello, Lottle. Hello, Vix. Welcome. I am Rustam, the hero of the Persian Empire, reborn in the modern day to battle evil on the internet. And you have all just wandered into the forces of the new Persian Empire. From here on out, you have two options. You can retreat as needed to get yourself some food, some water, or some rest if you require it. Or you may join us as we battle the forces of insomnia with some reading from the Shahnameh, the Persian book of myths, essentially. I saw your stream earlier. I was lurking there for a bit. You guys were playing uh, Yakuza 7, if I recall. <laughs> I really look forward to the day when I start playing those games. But uh, I'm afraid till that day comes, I'd like to at least try and avoid as many spoilers as I can. I've already been spoiled quite a bit when it comes to that particular series. So then, how was your stream? I hope it went well. I hope you had fun with Ichiban and his colorful cast of misfits and characters. In any case, welcome everyone. I hope you will all enjoy your time here with us. Now then, where was I? Ah yes, the, I was reading the Shanane. The game was fun. Sleepy now. Alright, get yourself some sleep. Um, thank you for the raid. I appreciate it a lot. Alright, now where we were at was chapter 1, in praise of holy God. In the name of the Lord of life and wisdom, the Lord of name and place, the Lord who guides along the path of righteousness, the Lord of the universe and the revolving planets, the Lord who gives light to the sun, moon, and... Oh my. I seem to be positively vibrating now that the AC has picked up in terms of sound. Hmm. This is why I put my volume sensitivity a bit higher. Now then... Okay, I think that is a bit better. I might have to adjust that again some t at some point later. Now, where was I? The Lord who gives light to the, no, the Lord of the universe and the revolving planets. The Lord who gives light to the sun, moon, and the stars. The Lord of not existence and non-existence bit off topic, but the moon is very pretty tonight in the new Persian Empire. I don't know how good it looks to anyone else who's currently looking at it, but to me it's a very bright moon tonight. I've always enjoyed looking at the moon and being struck by its beauty. It truly is a fascinating thing, isn't it? God is the one and only creator. All creatures are merely... Hmm. Okay, so the book says all creatures are merely his slaves. I'm not so sure I agree with that. But I will digress. 
and leave it to your own judgment as to whether or not this translation is as sensitive as it could be. All praise to the successful keeper of the universe who provides strength and skill. Don't I know it? He exercises sway over everything righteous and provides the remedy for all ills, joy and sorrow, opulence and penury, all spring from him. <laughs> now that's quite the word, isn't it? Penury. I wonder what it means. Why don't I look that up really quickly? Penury. Extreme poverty. Destitution. How interesting. Opulence and penury. Riches and nothing. Plenty and not so much. <laughs> Wealth and poverty. All spring from him. He has given us the power to choose between good and evil. He is far above all considerations of name, address, and residence, and is the sole architect of all that shines in the sky. So he's above residence and address? How on earth are we supposed to send him gifts then? What on earth does God put on his throne profile? He is the sole architect of all that shines in the sky. It is not possible to see him with our physical eyes. Hmm. I think I might want to readjust this real quick. Hmm. Okay. I think that might be a bit better. Yes, I think that's a bit better. It is not possible to see him with our physical eyes. Therefore, do not strain your eyes unnecessarily. Thoughts fail to realize him, and words fail to describe him. It is impossible for a wooden-headed person to be convinced of his existence. Hmm, wooden-headed. That's quite the creative insult. I might need to add that one to my arsenal. Once you are convinced of his existence by means of your superior intellect and wisdom. Well, that's not egotistical at all. Do not try to go deeper than this, nor waste your time in singing his praises with your limited powers of thought and speech. The best method of praising him is to gird up your loins in his service by carrying out his commandments and walking along the path of righteousness. Okay. So basically, don't waste time trying to kiss up to God. Just try and do good. I can get behind that. I think that's a pretty worthwhile endeavor. I feel like a lot of people could do with trying to follow along with that advice a bit more. Ability to do so, to walk along the path of righteousness, comes with the acquisition of knowledge. Knowledge rejuvenates the mind of an old person. Hmm. I can agree. I can definitely see that. Learning a new skill can certainly help to make you feel young again when you're older. Passion for learning is something that doesn't have to go away with age. Okay, I think that worked out. I really do need to put in some sort of filter. Wisdom, Chapter 2, In Praise of Wisdom. Wisdom is better than everything else which God has given. It is but right and just if you praise wisdom. Wisdom is the crown of kings and the jewel of nobles. 
Wisdom is the asset of life and the essence of immortality. Wisdom guides you and opens out your mind. It is wisdom that takes you by the hand and guides you through both the worlds. If wisdom is blacked out from the mind of a person, he will never be happy for a moment. A person who does not act wisely is bound to feel sorry for his unwise deeds. Sensible people call him insane and keep aloof from him. Wisdom guarantees you happiness in both the worlds. So wisdom is sanity, or perhaps reason? Without it, you become disabled. Wisdom is the eye of the soul. Without it, it is not possible to live happily in this world. Consider wisdom to be the first of creation. It is the watchman of the soul and has three helpers. The three helpers are the ear, the eye, and the tongue. Whatever good or bad we achieve is through these three helpers. Who is capable of singing the praises of wisdom and conscience? If I were to sing its praises, who has the ability to listen to them? If you regard all that is visible and ponderable, the orb. The orb is what is most ponderable, and all that is invisible and imponderable as the creation of God, then always make wisdom your guide, and with its help, keep your soul far from all that is undesirable. Therefore listen to the words of wise men, and discuss the same with people all over the world. What about wise women, and wise non-binary people? In my opinion, wisdoms are just as valuable as wisdoms. <laughs> wisdoms, wisdoms. <sighs> I digress. I ignore me. My mind is a flutter with sinful thoughts. There, listen to the okay. When you dis listen to the talk of many wise people, try to learn about it more and more, so as to broaden the mind and widen the outlook. Chapter three, on the creation of earth and sky. Ooh, I think we're getting to the creation stories. At the outset, one must realize that God created thing from nothing. Thing, huh? So God is Jack Kirby then? Jack Kirby created the thing and Mr. Fantastic and uh, Invisible Lady and uh, the Human Torch. <laughs> Speaking of the Human Torch, actually, never mind, that's a spoiler. Hmm. And then again, it has been a while since the movie came out. I hope everyone who went to see Deadpool and Wolverine enjoyed it. That was a fun movie. I just wish I could have continued playing the Wolverine game, but sadly the game decided it did not want to be played anymore. It's such a pity when your game freezes up your entire console. It truly is. I hope one day I'll be able to finish X-Men Origins Wolverine on stream. I really do. But anyways, in the beginning appeared fire due to incessant movements. I mean, yes, fire is technically energy created, heat energy created by incessant movement of atoms and electrons. That's heat energy. I think. Then again, I don't have the best memory when it comes to science. And it seems we have an ad break ongoing. That's a little annoying. Um. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
that ad manager that Twitch updated recently so that I can get a better handle on those ads. In the beginning appeared fire due to incessant movements. The heat of the fire gave rise to aridity. As a result of inertia or rest, cold resulted, which in turn gave rise to humidity. As a result of the elements interwoven into one another, appeared the fast revolving dome that displayed in it new wonders, one after another. The twelve signs of the zodiac appeared in which the seven planets occupied their rightful places. Seven planets? I'm fairly certain you're missing at least one or two. Twelve? Also, that's not how that happened. Then again, I guess Ferdosi was a bit before the time of the Big Bang and whatnot, at least in terms of knowledge. Numerous firmaments were then woven, one into another, which began revolving no sooner than they were constructed. The four elements then appeared. The fire was right at the top of the firmament, providing heat and light. In between the top and the bottom was air. Water was made to cover the earth. The earth was dark and uninhabitable. The stars then displayed their wonder and illuminated the dark earth, which were sharply delineated into rivers, mountains, forests, and deserts. That's still not how that happened according to science. But then again, who, by who, who is science to judge in the face of the knowledge of Ferdosi? Chapter 4 On the Creation of Vegetable and Animal Kingdom Due to the heat of the fire and the humidity provided by water, vegetation appeared in the form of grass and numerous varieties of trees. What about lichens and mosses and mushrooms? The plants derived their nourishment from the atmosphere. Plants display no activity other than growing. They cannot run about like animals, which came next and utilized the plants for their survival. That's still not how that works. The animals seek nourishment, rest and sleep, and procreate. Their tongues are not articulate, nor do they seek wisdom. They nourish and protect their bodies with thistle and leaves. I don't recall animals ever using thistles and leaves as clothes of any kind. They are blissfully ignorant of good or evil, and are unaware of the consequences of their actions. Therefore, the Creator does not expect any service from them. God did not reveal the purpose of creating all that he had created so far. Chapter 5 On the Creation of Man Next came the man. This solved the puzzle of creation. His head became erect as that of the stately cypress. I'm not even... I'm not going to make the obvious jokes. He carried out his activities after seeing things and thinking. He had acquired consciousness, wisdom, and formed his own opinions. Beasts of burden and carnivorae carry out his orders. I... 
really don't think they do that because of divine mandate. I'm pretty sure they do that because they're trained to do so. If you are wise enough to ponder upon the meaning of man, you will realize that you are the culmination of creation of both the worlds, and everything in creation is made for your upkeep. Again, that's not narcissistic in the slightest. <sighs> you were the first in God's mind when he made you the last of his creation. Do not belittle your creation as if it was child's play, nor consider it to be meaningless. Good advice were it not for the blind faith, I think. Therefore, observe carefully, contemplate the object of your existence, and whatever work you undertake, do it wisely. It is but fitting that you exercise your body to acquire knowledge and wealth. Knowledge, yes, but wealth, is that really important in life? Look at the rapidly revolving heavens that are responsible for your ills and also provide the remedy thereof. The revolution of the heavens provides the basis of your numbers and calculations. The blue sky is not a red ruby, nor is it made out of air, water, dust, or smoke. I've got news for you. It's made up of all of those things, especially in New Delhi. And Mumbai, too, coming to that. Honestly, just... Just... Wear masks if you're living in a city. The air quality is la like, likely to not be very good if you're in a city. The passing of time does not erase it. Our feverish activities and thoughts do not melt it. <laughs> Melting time... I'm pretty sure there was a dolly painting like that, with a bunch of melted clocks, wasn't there? Time never takes rest from its revolutions, nor does it show signs of wear and tear as we do. Hmm. Chapter 6 On the Creation of Sun and Moon With such bright illumination, and so many glittering lights, the firmament brightens up in the same way that a garden does on the Naroz day. Ah, Naroz. I wonder if I should do a special stream when Naroz comes around again. I would like to do that, but I will also have to celebrate with my family and the Parsi community next Naroz. Perhaps I can do a special stream the day after or before or the day closest to Naroz. A shining jewel appears and sheds its luster on the day. Hmm. Okay, the sun. At every dawn, like a golden shield, he rears up his illuminated head. The earth puts on an apparel of light, which lightens up the dark world. As he moves from the east to the west, the nighted darkness rears up its head in the east. So precisely do these movements take place that one does not overlap the other. Unless there's an eclipse. What happened to you, O oh moon, that you are not shining upon me tonight? The moon sh serves as a ready-made lamp for the dark night. Mm, I don't think Batman needs the moon as a lamp. He's rich enough to buy plenty of lamps. In any case, is it really a lamp if it reflects light? While she moves round and round for thirty days, she does not show her face for two days and two nights. Yes, that is the lunar cycle. Perhaps she gets worn out as a result of her revolutions, takes rest, and comes back look again looking very thin and yellow and bent just like the back of one disappointed in love. <laughs> now there's an insult for you. You look so disappointed in love that... Okay. Okay, maybe it takes a bit of work 
to insult someone and by saying they look like a crescent moon. I feel like that needs a bit of work, but I'm sure it's possible. On the first day, she vanishes no sooner than she appears. The next night, she appears earlier, gives more light, and stays longer. In two weeks' time, she regains her fullness and health and becomes her old self again. After that, she goes on becoming thinner and thinner, and moves nearer and nearer to the sun. That, that is how God has adjudicated her duties, and this will go on forever till God wills. Chapter 7 In Praise of the Prophet and His Companions If you want that your mind should ever feel never should never feel sad or be obligated to others, if you want to avoid evils and afflictions, and would like to be free from the ills of both the worlds, and face thy Creator with a good name, then act according to the sayings of your Prophet. Here Ferdosi praises the Prophet and his companions Abu Bakr, Omar, and Usman, but the most lavish praise is reserved for Ali, about whom the Prophet said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gateway to it. Ferdosi then exhorts the readers to follow the path of righteousness and to be ever ashamed of doing evil. So essentially the translator just summarized a bunch of stuff by Ferdosi into a few sort of sentences. Somehow I feel a little short changed by that. Chapter 8 About the Compilation of Shanameh Ferdosi says that by writing the Shanameh, he is planting a mighty tree whose fruits and shade he may not live to enjoy, but posterity certainly will. That reminds me of that old guy's speech in, in the Andor show, the one working to make a sunrise he'll never see. He advises the readers not to regard some of the things mentioned in the Shanameh as falsehood or fables, because circumstances and conditions vary from age to age. Most of the things mentioned therein appeal to reason, and some of the things which do not appear plausible should be regarded as allegorical. In the ancient days there was a book of many stories, but its contents were scattered and different portions were in the hands of different scholars. A valiant, elderly, wise, and brave knight, coming from a peasant stock, took great pains to bring all the scattered material in one place. By questioning each and every one of the elders, and by adding the authentic information obtained to the material collected, he laid the foundations of a mighty book which will perpetuate the memory of the events in the glorious past. That doesn't seem like a reliable method of recording your history, but to each their own. Chapter 9 About the poet Dakiki I am not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. A young man with facile tongue and pen came forward and said that he would like to write out the contents of the book in the form of poetry. The patrons accepted his offer with pleasure. Hardly had he written a thousand couplets about Gushtasp and Arjasp when his life came to an end. In his youth he had cultivated a bad habit in which he was constantly engaged, and ultimately paid with his life for it. The fate turned against him, and he was killed by a servant his. I should note that the translator seems to think that this bad habit could be homosexuality. To this I respond, that's homophobic. Hmm. It's a good thing I keep my phone muted during streams. I'm 
going to need to deal with that in the morning. Chapter 10 On Laying the Foundations of This Book And a Friend's Advice in This Regard Ferdosi was frantically anxious to write this book before he died. He, therefore, questioned innumerable persons for historical facts, but hardly anyone was able to furnish the material he required. At last, however, his persistent efforts were awarded. He became very intimate with a fellow citizen who had in his possession a historical treatise written in Pahlavi prose. He was very anxious that Ferdosi should write in Persian poetry, because according to him, poetry was a divine gift, and God's prophets conveyed the divine message to humanity in poetry. Hmm. I guess limericks are the preferred form of godly wisdom. Who knew? Chapter 11 in praise of Mansur bin Muhammad. When Ferdowsi started on his monumental work, he was greatly encouraged by a chieftain of illustrious lineage who was wise, alert, conscientious, and God-fearing. With well-chosen words, softly spoken, he promised Ferdowsi that he would place at the poet's disposal whatever material he had so that Ferdosi need not be worried about hunting for it. Ferdosi felt quite elated with such assurance, but, as fate would have it, the chivalrous chieftain was assassinated by some ignominious persons, plunging the poet into the depths of gloom and despair. However, he held fast to the one advice of the murdered chieftain that the work should be dedicated to kings, Thus thought brightened Ferdosi's soul with a ray of hope. Ah. I wonder if one day someone's going to make Yaoi of Ferdosi and his beloved... What's the bright word here? Mm, let me think. Patron, I suppose, would be the right word. Ferdosi and his beloved patron. <laughs> Chapter 12 In praise of Sultan Mahmud and his brother Amir Nasser, Ferdosi describes the pomp, power, sense of justice, and other sterling qualities of the head and heart of Sultan Mahmud and his younger brother Amir Nasser. Chapter 13. Kayumars. Kayumars, the king of Iran, ruled for thirty years. Kayumars sits on the throne and incurs the envy of the evil-spirited Dev. Nobody knows precisely who the first ruler was on this earth. According to oral traditions carried by word of mouth from father to son, Kayumars is said to be the first man to rule in this world. At the time of his ascension to the throne, the sun was in the sign of Aries. His palace was a cave in the mountains. He clothed himself in leopard skin. His reign lasted for thirty years. Hmm. He was blessed with a son who was very handsome and skillful. Kayumars doted upon his only son, whose presence made him very happy, and separation from whom was very painful for him. For him, Such is the prevailing convention of this world, that a father derives strength from his son. A father can derive strength from his child regardless of the gender, I think. At least a good father can. Still, it sounds like Kayumars had a fair deal of separation anxiety. <laughs> but I suppose that can't be helped. That's just how it is when you become a father. None challenged the sovereignty of Kayumars, except an evil-spirited Dev, who felt envious of the monarch's suzerainty, and with the help of his evilly-disposed son, 
secretly plotted warfare against Cayumars. Cayumars was unaware of this conspiracy until the angel Surush came down from heaven, revealed it to him, and foretold the fact that his son Siamak was destined to meet at the hands of the enemy. Chapter 14 Siamak goes to war against the Dev and gets killed. Womp womp. As soon as Siamak heard of the plot, he gathered his forces, put on leopard skin, for in those days the mailed coat had not been invented, and grappled with the evil-spirited Dev's son who prevailed over Siamak and after throwing him down, disemboweled him with his bare hands. Well, there's a pretty picture. When Kayumars heard of his son's death, the world appeared dark to him. He and his subjects mourned Siamak's death for a year when the propitious Surush came from the Almighty God and exhorted Kayumars to gird up his loins and destroy all evil-spirited persons on the face of this earth. Kayumars then started making preparations to avenge Siamak's death. Depression really can be horrible, and grief more so. But a year's worth of grief when you're a king? I feel like you, even if a king gets depressed, he still has a job to do. Also, gird up your loins is quite the way to say, pull yourself up. <laughs> I'm definitely going to try and remember that. Chapter 15 Hushang and Kayumars go to war against the Dev. The Dev gets killed. Death of Kayumars. Siamak had a son named Hushang. Hushang, I don't know. Who acted as counselor to his grandfather, who loved his grandson so much that he never let him out of his sight. One day he exhorted Hushang to lead his forces in war against the dead. Hushang mobilized an army of trained birds and wild animals, such as lions, leopards, and wolves, and marched at the head of his forces. Wow, that sounds like quite the interesting force. I feel like half of it would end up eating the other, though. Remind me in the future to research the viability of building an army out of animals. Kayumars brought up the rear. The wild animals played havoc with the Dev's army. Hushang got the better of the Dev, threw him on the ground, tied him up, dragged him for a distance, and cut off his head. Soon after, Kayumars died, leaving the world behind him. Here, Ferdosi draws attention to the ephemerality of earthly existence. Chapter 16 Hushang Hushang ruled for forty years. He sits on the throne and extracts iron out of stone and lays the foundation of Jashin Isada. As soon as Hushang placed his grandfather's crown on his head, he vowed to rule with wisdom and justice according to the commandments of God. He was the first to bring about separation of iron from stone and established the iron monger's trade, resulting in the manufacture of implements such as axe, saw, and chisel. Wasn't Ironmonger that Obadiah Stane fellow from the first Iron Man movie? The one who built a big knockoff Iron Man suit and then got shot with a tank missile? Or wait, am I getting confused? I don't think he was shot with a tank missile. I think that was uh, how it should have ended. I think what happened to Obadiah was... Uh, his suit got fried by an EMP or something. Am I remembering correctly? I might need to go back and rewatch those movies.
Next, he diverted water from rivers into fields, Hushang, not Obadiah's fame, thus making agricultural operations like sowing and reaping possible. Prior to this, human beings subsisted purely on fruits. I find that difficult to believe. I'm sure they must have had some kind of meats. Worship of God was practiced even before his days. Hu Shang was the first to discover fire quite accidentally. I really don't think that's how that happened. You're telling me that there was a king with a civilization before fire was even discovered? I find that very hard to believe. One day, Hu Shang was walking towards the mountains with his companions when a huge python came into view on the rocks. Hu Shang instinctively picked up a big boulder and threw it in the direction of the serpent in order to kill it. The python escaped, but the impact of the boulder on the rock sparked up a conflagration which excited the wonder of all present, for nothing like it had ever been seen before. This, these stories truly do stagger all belief, as well as suspension of disbelief. But I must say that was quite the overreaction to having a snake appear before you. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want it there, but to pick up a whole boulder and throw it. <laughs> Hu Shang certainly had moxie. The king bowed down before the fire and installed it as a divine symbol. At nightfall, the fire became manifest in all its glory. The king and his followers established that historic day as the Jashan e Sada day, fire festival day. Here, Ferdowsi clarifies that the ancient Iranians should not be dubbed fire worshippers. Fire, to them, was merely a symbol of divinity, just as the Merab of a mosque made of stones was to the Tazis, the Arabs. Hmm, interesting. And I should note, when we're talking about Iranians in this book, we're talking about Zoroastrians. More or less. So yes, the ancient Iranians were Zoroastrians. And worshippers of Ahura Mazda, also known as God. Next, Hushang isolated beasts of utility from wild animals and encouraged the breeding of the former. The wild animals, such as beaver and ermine, were hunted and their fur made use of to cover the body. If his grandfather wore a leopard skin, as proof of his right to rule, I would have imagined that the use of animal pelts was, uh, for clothing was occurring long before this. Hmm. It seems we have an ad going again. I don't know why this, my Twitch does not see fit to inform me when we have ad breaks going. I feel like uh, it should be warning me in advance, but it never does, except for the beginning of stream. It truly is rather vexing to me. I suppose we must simply wait for the ad to wrap up.
Hushong's reign brought about peace, prosperity, plenty, and happiness to his subjects. Ultimately, he died. Ferdosi points out that the world never shows consistent affection for anybody. Hmm. An interesting way to look at it. The world never shows consistent affection to anybody. <laughs> How true, indeed. Chapter 17 Tamuras Tamuras reigned for 30 years. He sits on the throne and discovers the art of weaving and the taming of animals. I thought his father had discovered that. This book really seems to have each new generation of king rediscovering something that his ancestor did. <sighs> Goodness. I'm sorry for that. That was quite the yawn. As soon as Tamuras sat on the throne, he vowed before an assembly of nobles that he was determined to wash all evil from this world. Quite the ambitious goal, considering no one's ever been able to do it. During his reign, the hairs covering the bodies of sheep were sheared, and the art of weaving thus came into existence. He tamed all animals and provided the herbivorous animals with green leaves, grass, and barley. Wild animals like the cheetah and fox were captured alive and kept in a zoo, while the birds like the hawk and the shikara were trained and trained for hunting, captured and trained for hunting. He instructed his subjects not to be cruel to animals but to show the utmost kindness to them. Hens and cocks were reared and utilized for domestic needs. Is it really that hard to simply call them roosters? Also, all animals? I, I doubt that. You're not really taming an animal if you keep it in a zoo. <sighs> Goodness. Those yawns seem to be piling up. Having done all these, Tamaras exhorted his subjects to offer praise and thanks to God for giving them the power to exercise control over the animals. In his benevolent actions, Tamaras was guided by a noble and God-fearing counselor named Shidasp. Shidasp ate very frugally in the daytime and spent the night in offering prayers to God. With such a gem of a counselor to guide him, Tamaras's capacity to do good to humanity strengthened day by day. He now concentrated his attention on curbing the activities of the devs, antisocial elements, who became alarmed and conspired to kill him. Interesting. Chapter 18 Incarceration of Devs by Tamuras and His Death Hmm. Incarceration of political opponents doesn't sound very wise to me. But then again, perhaps devs in this context means something else. Who knows? When Tamuras got intelligence of the conspiracy, he marched his forces against the devs, who, led by the black dev, fought by raising fire and smoke screens. Interesting. <laughs> the black dev. Sounds like simply 
Sounds like simply a malcontent faction led by a black knight using fire and smoke screens. Sounds like explosions of some kind. The devs were soon overcome. Two thirds of them were captured alive while one third perished fighting. The captured devs asked for clemency and promised to teach Tamodas a new art if their lives were spared. Always anxious to learn something new, Tamodas spared their lives. The devs then taught Tamodas the art of writing, not in one language, but in thirty different languages, such as Byzantine, Arabic, Persian, Indian, Chinese, and Pallavi. He went a whole kingship without knowing how to write? At this point, nothing surprises me anymore. Tamuros died after 30 years of glorious reign. Verdosi laments this and asks the world why it rears up people only to kill. He derives consolation from the fact that although Tamaras died, the good that he did lived after him. Chapter 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 19 Jamshid Jamshid ruled for 700 years. He sits on the throne, manufactures weapons of war, and teaches men other arts and crafts. <laughs> Jamshed is a rather common name among Parsi men, as far as I know. I know at least one or two Jamsheds. They're quite lovely people. Tamuras was succeeded by his son Jamshed, who commanded the services of devs, birds, and fairies. Okay, what on earth are these devs? Under the inspiration of Archangel Surush. Hey, it's Surush again. He laid the foundations of Mazdayasna, god worship, and introduced the wearing of Kushti around the waist as symbolic of the same. Kushti are sacred threads, basically rope, ropes that you tie around your waist while saying your prayers each night as part of being a Zoroastrian. However, not everyone does this, especially in modern days. In order to curb the activities of evildoers, he invented the manufacture of weapons of war and gave them to the knights. He melted iron and manufactured helmet, mailed coat, and metal chain covering for the protection of war horses. Fifty years of his reign were spent in these activities. The next fifty years were devoted to research in making different types of clothing for use in wartime and on festive occasions. He made use of jute, silk, hair, and fine metal wire to make clothing. The art of weaving and spinning and embroidery thus came into existence. The next 50 years were spent in systemizing a classification of human beings according to their profession. 50 years on that? That seems like a really inefficient way to use time. We're already up to, I think, 150 years of this fellow's reign. Or perhaps 200. Hmm, let me look again. No, it was 150. Those who spent their time in meditation, metaphysical speculations, intellectual occupations, and worship of God were called Asurnans, warriors and knights who were responsible for protecting the king 
and country from the evil designs of enemies were named Rateshtars. The third group, named Vastavas, consisted of farmers, peasants, and agriculturalists who sowed the seeds, reaped the harvest, and ate their food by the sweat of their brow. They held their heads high because they were not dependent on others for their nourishment, while praising their exertions and hard work, and holding them up as examples. For Dosi draws the moral that men should not waste their time in idleness and sloth, for laziness reduces independent men to the status of abject slavery. Hmm. Not entirely wrong, I suppose. The fourth class, named Atukashi, was composed of laborers and menials who depended only on physical labor for their livelihood and were always worried as to when they would get their next meal. Ah, <sighs> goodness, that hits far too realistically. <sighs> the emperor next ordered the devs to mix earth with water prepare bricks, raise walls, and to construct bathhouses and palaces. Hmm. I really don't understand why OBS has been so difficult recently. I really don't. Emperor next ordered the devs to mix earth with earth with water, prepare bricks, raise walls, and construct bathrooms and palaces. It's always palaces, isn't it? He then discovered the art of extracting from the earth noble metals like gold and silver and precious stones like rubies, jaspers. Fragrant substances such as amber, camphor, musk, and incense were prepared. The art of healing and remedies for all diseases were discovered. Great emphasis was laid on maintenance of good health and prevention of diseases. The art of navigation came into existence, thus, enabling people to go from one country to another. Another fifty years were thus occupied, and now we are up to two hundred years of this fellow's reign, during which time he apparently discovered things that I feel should probably have been common sense. 
This, I suppose, is simply what comes of having an oral history put down to pen in the way Ferdosi did. He now turned his attention to making a jeweled throne which was lifted by the devs into the air, thus carrying the emperor from place to place. I am ve very much confident that did not happen. The day on which Jamshid sat on the throne was called Naroz. It fell on the day Hormaz, the first day of the month, and when Naroz is called New Day. And, okay, Hormaz, the first day of the month, and Farvardin, the first month of the year. So the first day of the first month of the year is Naroz. This New Year festival is still observed in Iran as coming from the days of Jamshid. Three hundred years rolled by. In this period, hardly anyone fell ill or died. Nobody was unemployed. Sorrow and anxiety were unknown. There was prosperity, peace, plenty, and happiness all around. The devs and birds obeyed Jamshed's commands. <laughs> my, my. Quite the rain. Chapter 20 Jamshid turns away from God, and the times turn away from him. It's always the way, isn't it? After a certain period of peace, prosperity, and plenty, pride entered Jamshid's soul. Since nobody questioned his suzerainty, and everybody acknowledged his greatness and power. He began to think he was God Almighty himself. He sent for the army officers and recalled to them how he had taught mankind arts and crafts, eradicated disease and death, and brought about peace and prosperity. He therefore commanded them to worship him alone as God. Such a desire of megalomania caused feelings of disgust and revolution among the people. One by one, everybody deserted him, and in the course of twenty-three years he found himself alone, without a helper or a sympathizer. Ferdosi points out here that one who rebels against God has to pay the penalty for the same. Such an ungrateful wretch loses confidence in himself and all sorts of fears and apprehensions take possession of him. When Jamshid saw everything good disappearing and being replaced by evil, he shed tears of blood and repented, but it was too late. Ah, oh, poor guy. I feel like this should be the point where some kind of brave hero rises up. Chapter 21 the story of Mardas, the Tazi, Arab, father of Zaha. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. The leader of the nomads in the deserts of Arabia in those days was a pious, God-fearing man named Mardas. He eked out his livelihood by tending flocks of sheep, goats, camels, cows, and horses, and by selling milk. He had a son named Zahak, whose nature was shorn of love and pity, and who was hasty, irritable, and tyrannical. His nickname was Bivarasp, Beaver, in the Pallavi dialect was equivalent to 10,000 in the Dari dialect. He was so nicknamed 
because he possessed 10,000 horses. Interesting. 10,000 horses with an attitude like that? Hard to believe. One day Satan, in the guise of a well-wisher, approached him and captivated him by his pleasing manners and interesting talk. That iron mouse sat it again, it seems. Having gained his confidence completely, the Satan managed to extract an oath of secrecy from Zahak and instigated him to dispose of his father and take his place. Of course. At first, Zahak protested against what seemed unnatural to him, but the Satan soon coaxed him into overcoming his scruples and killing his own father. Mardas had a lovely garden in his palace compound, to which he was wont to repair at dawn every morning in order to perform his absolution, his ablutions prior to offering prayers to God. So the leader of the nomads has a palace? That seems a bit oxymoronic. One night, Satan dug a deep well in the path leading to the garden from the palace and camouflaged it by covering its surface with straw and dried leaves. Oh, a pit trap. Ah, uh, I don't have good experiences with those. Mardas, who never suspected this, fell into the well and died, a foul victim to the evil designs of his beloved son, whom he had brought up with such tender care and affection. I believe that is the second... Hmm, no, actually, perhaps not. Here, Ferdosi laments that while even the offspring of a wild lion never thinks of killing its progenitor, the wild lions certainly do kill their own children, though. When the new male takes over the pride, they always kill the kids of the old male. Here, Ferdosi laments that while even the offspring of a wild lion never thinks of killing its progenitor, an ungrateful human being has no scruples in killing its own fa his own father. Again, Lions may not kill their elders, but they certainly do kill their youngers. He further states that if a son does not follow in the footsteps of his father, he does not deserve to be called a son, but should be treated as a stranger. Now, now, a son doesn't necessarily have to do what his father does. But uh, if he is a disappointment, well, I guess that depends on how he is a disappointment. If he acts maliciously towards his family after being shown love, care, and respect, though, then yes, that's not very nice or forgive easily forgiven. Having fulfilled a part of his nefarious mission, the Satan, next, approached Zahak in the guise of an excellent cook and took charge of the kitchen. In those days, people subsisted on vegetables and cereals alone. They still haven't gotten meat. First, they had fruits. Now they have vegetables and cereal, but not meat. That, f that feels doubtful. The Satan devised an ingenious scheme to destroy animals. At first, he gave Zahak the yellow of an egg to taste. As soon as Zahak cultivated a liking for it, and it felt more energetic and healthy, he was fed with the flesh of fowl and quadrupeds. As Zahak's conscience was more and more blunted, the Satan racked his brains for a newer variety and fed him on partridge and turkey. 
Then he killed a young calf, cooked its flesh, and dressed it with saffron, rose, wine of old vintage, and musk. Zahak was so taken up with the different types of dishes that he told the Satan to ask of him any favor he liked. Wow, really got into the man's heart through his stomach, it seems. The Satan thereupon asked Zahak's permission to kiss his shoulders and to rub his eyes and nose on them. Given permission, the Satan did so and vanished from sight. Wow. That's, uh, okay. Two black serpents started growing from the shoulders where the Satan had kissed. When all remedies failed, Zaha cut off the serpents from the shoulders, but every time he cut them off, they started growing again. Holy Hydra, bad man. No physician was able to cure Zahak. Satan, then, in the guise of a physician, suggested to Zahak that the only remedy was to feed the two serpents with two human brains daily. The Satan, who is the sworn enemy of mankind, wrought this scheme in order to rid the world of human beings. So first animals and now human beings? At a rate of two brains every day? <laughs> that seems like a rather slow burn in terms of destroying humanity. But I guess Satan can afford to be patient. Chapter 22 The End of Jamshid's Days at the Hands of Zahak Oh no. When Jamshid turned away from God, the Iranian chiefs rebelled against him and went over to Zahak and urged him to take over the throne of Iran. Was there really no one more qualified than the father killer with snakes on his shoulders who kept feeding them human brains? There really wasn't anyone more qualified than that guy? With their help, Zahak marched into Iran and sat on the throne. Jamshid fled and hid himself successfully for a hundred years, Quite the long haul. He was finally traced out, captured, and brought to Zahak, who immediately sawed his body into two halves. How undignified. Ferdosi points out how Jamshid, even after a glorious reign of seven hundred years, my goodness, was ultimately destroyed by the same world that had fed him on milk and honey all along. The world is such, says Ferdosi, who therefore advises men to sow nothing but the seeds of righteousness in this world during their lifetime. Memento Mori indeed. Chapter 23 Zahak's reign lasted for a day less than one thousand years. Really? So he beat Jamshid's uh, record despite being a serpent-shouldered, human-brain-feasting tyrant. How sad. Jam Zahak sits on the throne and lays the foundation of injustice. During Zahak's thousand years' reign, evil-minded persons thrived, and none dared practice righteousness except in secret. Zahak sounds a lot like Aku from Samurai Jack. Jamshid had two beautiful daughters named Shaharnaz and Arnawaz. Zahak forced them to pander to his lust and taught them black magic and witchcraft. So Zahak invented the goth girl, huh? He spent all his life in destructive activities like loot, grape, and arson. Ah, my goodness. Every night two young men, irrespective of whether they came from the poorest class or from a family of knights, were dragged into the ruler's kitchen, slaughtered, and had their brains taken out and fed to the two serpents on Zahak's shoulders. 
two righteous men of royal descent named Armayal and Garmayal felt very sad that two precious lives had to be thus sacrificed every night for an unworthy cause. They resorted to a stratagem in order to save as many lives as possible. Entering Zahak's kitchen co as cooks, they came to the conclusion that the best they could do without the risk of being detected was to sacrifice only one person, mix his brains with that of a sheep, and thus feed Zahak's servants. The one man whose life was spared every night was then asked to make himself scarce and seek refuge in a far-off wilderness. The present-day Kurs are none but the descendants of such men whose lives were saved one by one every night. They have no settled homes and lead a nomadic life in tents made of cloth. I feel like that's offensive to the Kurdish people. Also, if you can substitute one man's brain with the brain of a sheep, why not simply use the brains of sheep for both brains? Why only save one man's life when you could save both if sheep brains are able to work to deceive Zaha? Meanwhile, Zahak's tyranny increased day by day. He would accuse able-bodied young men of the crime of resisting evil-minded persons and would execute them summarily. Beautiful young, beautiful young girls were brought to his harem by force and compelled to become the victims of his lust. This was something quite against the ethics and morals of Iranian civilization. Okay... Chapter 24 Zahak sees Faridun in his dream. While forty years still remained of his life, Zahak was sleeping one night with Arnawaz and dreamt that three knights were coming towards him from the royal palace. Two of the three were elderly, and the third one, in the middle, was tall, young, and of a royal bearing. He had a cow's head shaped mace in his hand. Rushing towards Zahak, the young knight dealt a blow on his head with the mace, felling Zahak down. He then tied up Zahak's hands with his belt, put a yoke upon his neck, and dragged him towards Damavand Mountain. A crowd of wonderstruck populace was following them. Zahak awoke from the stream stricken with mortal fear, and was trembling violently. It seems the hero has now been prophesied. Arnawaz got up and asked Zahak what had happened to him. The trembling monarch narrated the nightmarish dream. On Arnawaz's advice, he sent for astrologers, soothsayers, and dream interpreters, and commanded them, on pain of execution, to interpret his frightful dream. The boldest of them, Zirak, by name, ventured to say that Zahak's end would come at the hands of one, Faridun, who had not yet been born. Zahak asked Zirak, Zirak what reason would Faridun have to depose him. Zirak replied that Zahak would kill Faridun's father and their cow Purmaya, whose milk will nourish Faridun. The latter would avenge their deaths by deposing Zahak. When Zahak heard this, he swooned. I don't think that's the correct usage of the word. When he came round, he started making inquiries all over the world regarding Faridun. Henceforth, he lost all appetite, sleep, and peace of mind. Chapter 25 About the Birth of Faridun Some years later, Faridun was born as a lovely baby and grew up to be a very sweet child. A few years prior to this, an extraordinarily lovely calf was born with multicolored hairs on its body. All the astrologers and the wise men of the place came to see this lovely calf and predicted that it was destined to play an important part in this world. It was named Purmaya. 
The Hawks spies were roaming all over the land to get some news about Faridun's whereabouts. Faridun's father, Atbin, was constantly on the move from one place to another to avoid detection. But ultimately, he was caught by the Hawks agents and put to death and taken to the tyrant who put him to death. Ah, don't you just love self-fulfilling prophecies? Faridun's mother, Farang, Faranak, upon seeing her husband's fate, rushed with the suckling babe Faridun into the forest and entrusted him to the care of the shepherd who was looking after the cow Purmaya. For three years, Faridun thrived on Purmaya's milk. Then Faranak had a premonition that Zahak might come there to seek Faridun. So she took the precious infant from the shepherd and went to the Elber's mountain, where a holy man was residing. She told him that Faridun was destined to be the leader of the people who would depose Zahak. She implored the holy man to look after her son until he grew up. Thus, the saintly per this the saintly person willingly agreed to do. Zahak, meanwhile, chased out the cow Purmaya and killed her. Having failed to lay his hands on Faridun there, he raised Faridun's house to the ground by setting fire to it. Chapter 26 Faridun asks his mother his lineage. When Faridun was sixteen years of age, he came down from the Elber's mountain and implored his mother to enlighten him about his lineage and parentage. Faranak told him with pride that Atbin, who traced his descendant, who traced his descent from King Tamuras, was his father. She went on to recapit recapul recapitulate how the astrologers had warned Zahak that his end would come at the hands of Faridun, whereupon how Zahak searched every nook and corner for him, how he killed Atbin and fed his brain to the serpents on Zahak's shoulders, how Zahak sacked his dwelling place, how she carried him away to safety under the tender care of the cowherd who was tending the wonder cow Purmaya, how Faridun was nourished on her milk, and how she carried him away to the Elber's mountain before Zahak could come and kill Purmaya. When Faridun heard all this, he got very excited and vowed to avenge Zahak's misdeeds then and there. His mother dissuaded him by pointing out how powerful Zahak was, and counseled him to exercise patience. Zahak asks the elders to sign a statement extolling him as a paragon of virtue. Kava the blacksmith tears it to pieces. What a based blacksmith! Zahak was so obsessed with the fear of Faridun that he sent for chieftains and wise men from the different parts of his kingdom. After expressing his fears about Faridun, he suggested that the strength of the army should be raised by recruiting able-bodied individuals from among the hosts of men, devs, and fairies. He knew that to succeed in this object he should curry favor with the public. With this in view, he ordered the assembled chieftains and wise men to sign a statement, which he had written out, saying that Zahak was one who sowed the seeds of righteousness, always spoke the truth, and ever upheld justice. The elders, out of fear, signed the statement blindly. Ah, propaganda! Tale as old as time. At that very moment, a man entered the palace, crying and shouting for justice. When Zahak asked for his credentials, he replied that he was Kava the blacksmith. He had eighteen sons, out of whom now only one remained alive, and he too had just been brought into the royal kitchen for his brain to be removed and fed to the servants growing on Zahak's shoulders. He demanded that this only surviving son be spared and restored to him. Zahak was taken aback at this demonstration of boldness, but in order to win over Kava to his side, 
he ordered that the son be restored to his father. The king then asked him to sign the statement that was already attested to by the elders. When Kava read the contents, he was beside himself with rage. He accused the elders of selling their souls to the devil. Trembling with righteous indignation and wild with rage, he tore the paper to pieces and stamped the pieces under his feet. He then walked out of the palace with his son. Zahak's flunkies and lackeys humored the tyrant and asked him why he tolerated such insolent behavior on the part of an ordinary subject of his. Zahak explained that as soon as Kava entered the premises of his palace, he saw an iron mountain arising between him and Kava, and when Kava beat his own head with his hands out of anguish, Zahak felt quite paralyzed from fear. As soon as Kava came out of the palace, he was joined by a multitude. Kava extorted the people to fight, exhorted the people to fight for justice. He then took out the piece of leather covering one of his feet, for in those days blacksmiths used to cover their feet with pieces of leather, and fixed it to the tip of his lance. Raising it aloft and carrying it with him as a standard, he rallied the multitude to join, follow him to Faridun, whose hiding place he knew. When Faridun saw the standard of revolt, he covered the leather with silk cloth and decked it with multicolored jewels, and after casting the horoscope, named it the Kavayani Standard. Ever since then, every one of the succeeding kings of Aran used to add brighter and brighter jewels to the standard originally made out of leather, and covered it with the finest of cloth. In the course of time, the bejeweled and bedecked standard began to shine like the sun, and came to be regarded as the hope of the world. Some time after this, Faridun sought leave of his mother to march against Sahak. With tears in her eyes, his mother entrusted him to the care of Almighty God. Faridun had two brothers older than him, named Kayanush and Purmaya. They named one of the children after the cow? Or did they name one of the or did they name the cow after the chil child? To them he disclosed his intentions and exhorted them to bring blacksmiths so that they may fashion out a mighty mace. He drew a diagram of a cow's head on the sand, and when the blacksmiths made a mace of that shape, Faridun was very pleased with them, gave them gold and silver, and promised that if he overcame Zahak, he would usher in an era of peace and justice. Chapter 28 Faridun marches against Zahak. After collecting his forces, Faridun marched at the head of his army, with his elder brothers Kayanush and Purmaya flanking him on either side. At nightfall they approached a colony of god-worshippers, and there they halted. A handsome man with long hairs extending up to his legs, up to his legs, came along to greet them and to offer advice on important matters. He was the archangel Surush himself. He taught Faridun some holy mantras which he could neutralize the effects of black magic with, Faridun felt quite elated. After a hearty meal and refreshing drinks, he went off to sleep. When Faridun's brothers saw that Faridun was so favored by Surush, the envy entered their souls, and they conspired to do away with him. Faridun was sleeping in the shade of a rock, balanced on the top of which was a big boulder. The two brothers quietly climbed onto the top of the rock and pushed the boulder. As it came tumbling down, the noise woke up Faridun, who, by means of the mantras taught to him, arrested the fall of the stone, which seemed as if it was transfixed in midair. After taking rest, Faridun resumed his marching with Kava at the head of the army, holding the Kavayani standard aloft. When they reached the river called Arvand in Pallavi, Dajla in Arabic, and Tigris in English, 
Faridun called upon the boatmen to provide enough number of boats to carry all the soldiers across the river. The boatswain regretted his inability to do so, saying that Zahak had given strict orders not to provide boats to anyone who did not possess a permit with the royal seal affixed on it. Faridun treated the boatswain's refusal with the scorn with which it deserved, and straightway plunged into the river on the back of his lion-hearted steed called Gurang. All the soldiers followed their valiant leader's example, although they were afraid in their heart of hearts. At last, every one of them managed to cross the river safely. From here they marched on to the city called Gang des Hukt in Palabi, Beit ul Mukadas in Arabic, and Jerusalem in English. Hmm. So he took Jerusalem. Nice. Faridun Zahak's magnificent palace was seen from a distance of one mile. Faridun correctly guessed that it was Zahak's palace. Without waste of time, he went in with the mighty mace in his hand. He pulled down the talisman with it, which Zahak had fixed to the top of the palace gateway, and smote down with his mace all who tried to obstruct him. He then sat on Zahak's throne. Not finding Zahak in the palace, he sent for the female inmates of Zahak's harem and ordered their heads and bodies to be cleansed and bathed. Jamshid's daughters asked Faridun who he was and how he could muster courage to ride into the palace uninvited. Faridun replied that he had come to avenge the deaths of his father, Adbin, and the holy cow Purmaya, which was his nurse. He then asked them the whereabouts of Zahak. They told them that Zahak, having realized that his days were numbered, as told by the astrologers, had fled Iran and gone to Hindustan, in the hope that he may thereby be able to avert his predestined fate. He was massacring human beings and animals, collecting their blood in a tub, and bathing his head and body in it, thinking that thereby his fate will be averted. They also revealed that the serpents on his shoulders were causing him maddening pain. Intense restlessness compelled him to run from one place to another, and the same restlessness was bound to bring him back any moment. Chapter 29 Zahak's agent Kundarav runs away from Faridun and conveys the news to Zahak. A spy! Whenever Zahak used to be away from the capital, his palace was looked after and his affairs managed by an agent named Kundarav. Hmm. So less of a spy then, and more of a major domo. When Kundarav saw a new monarch sitting on the throne with the stately Shaharnaz on one side, and the lovely Arnavaz on the other, and all the elders doing obeisance to him. Obeisance? Is, is that a word? I'm looking that up. Goodness, it is a word. It means deferential respect. <laughs> wow. This is why I love reading. It always gives me more to work with in the old vocabulary department. <sighs> I miss doing this. It's been a while since I've read a good book. I should do this more often, I think. Well, in any case, it looks like Arnavaz and Shaharnaz turned on uh, Zahak pretty quickly, <laughs> even after he taught them black magic and everything. Nice. I was afraid that uh, Faridun would have had to fight them or something. But no, he just got two goth girls. Anyways, when Kundarav saw the new monarch sitting on the throne with Shaharnaz and Arnavaz on either side of him and all the elders doing obeisance to him, 
with their arms folded and the city filled with his soldiers, he immediately gauged the situation and tactfully came forward to offer his homage. Faridun ordered him to bring wine, songsters, and eatables to celebrate their coronation. Kundarav carried out the orders. Faridun celebrated the happy occasion with merriment till past midnight. At the break of dawn, Kundarav mounted a swift seed and rode post haste to Zahak and acquainted him with the recent happenings, how three men with a large army had occupied the city, how the youngest of the three stood head and shoulders above the other two, how he had carried a mace as heavy as a boulder, how he entered the palace on horseback and demolished the talisman and all other accessories of black magic, and finally how he broke the skulls of Zahak's followers with his heavy mace. So he made up with his brothers after they tried to kill him, hmm? Oh, it seems I've been reading through the ad break. That's a pity. Hmm. I don't know at what point the ad started, unfortunately. Then again, I suppose the ads didn't really cover up much. All that happened so far was that Kundarav read the room and offered his support and helped uh, with the, what's the word, mm, catering. Yes, that's the word. He helped with the catering. Uh, f and the staffing as well for Faridun's coronation. And after that, he ran off to Zahak and told him everything. On hearing this, Zahak asked what harm was there if a guest made himself quite at home in his palace. Kundarav replied that a guest who comes armed with a heavy mace and upsets all the existing arrangements of the palace must be a strange guest indeed. Not wrong, I suppose. Zahak said that a guest who enjoys himself without any inhibitions or reservations is to be welcomed. Kundara then asked the dull-witted Zahak what business did a guest have with the inmates of the royal harem. He pointed out how Faridun conversed freely with Jamshid's daughters and consulted them on, in all matters how he petted Shaharnaz's cheek with one hand, and the ruby-red lips of Arnavaz with the other, how he slept between the two beauties at night fondling their disheveled hair, how he toyed with them and spoke derisively about Zahak while doing so, how he killed Zahak's knights and devs. <laughs> nice. When Zahak heard this, he became wild with rage. Abusing Kundara filthily, he raved that no more would he appoint him as his agent. Kundara coolly replied that Zahak was not likely to get back his throne and crown, so the question of his appointing him agent or not did not arise. He taunted Zahak that since he had been removed as effortlessly as a hair from dough, he should settle the score first with the enemy who had sat on his throne, had demolished his talismans, and was caressing his sweetheart. Chapter 30 Faridun fights with Zahak and incarcerates him in Damavan Mountain. When Zahak heard the taunts of his agent Kundarav, he was beside himself with rage. He rushed with his army to the palace, which was taken possession of by Faridun. A terrific fight ensued. Oh, hold on a moment. It seems I need to once again adjust the sensitivity on the PNG. I really wish I didn't have to do this. I really do. <sighs> A terrific fight ensued between the forces of Faridun and Zahak. The entire populace was on Faridun's side, declaring that the people would any day prefer a wild beast on the throne to Zahak. Wow, they really do have low standards. 
while the fight was going on, Zahak, who was mad with rage on seeing Faridun sporting with Shaharnaz and Arnavaz, put on his black mailed coat, covered his head and face with a visor in order to mask his identity, and rushed forth with a dagger towards the two beauties. Faridun, who was alert, took up his mace and brought it down heavily on Zahak's head. He wanted to finish off Zahak, who lay stunned, but the blessed Sudosh intervened and asked Faridun to refrain from hitting Zahak any further because his destined end had not yet come. He advised Faridun to tie up Zahak with rope and incarcerate him in a cave of the Damavand mountain. Faridun proceeded to carry out Sudosh's behest. Zahak's trussed-up body was thrown over a camel's back and carried to Mount Damavand. Here again, Faridun was seized with an impulse to kill Zahak, but Sudosh intervened again and dissuaded Faridun from doing so because the Almighty had not decreed his death as yet. So Zahak was carried into the deepest cave in the Damavand mountain, tied with massive chains and abandoned there in a pitiable position. Firdosi points out how Zahak covered himself with shame and infamy. Infamy? It's spelt ilfamy. Is that a word? Ilfamy by his evil deeds. He contrasts this with the magnanimous nature of Faridun, who he says was not an angel, nor was he made of musk and or amber. He achieved glory and renown simply by virtue of his fair-mindedness and philanthropic deeds. Hmm, a lovely story indeed. Hmm. I think this is where we should end it. We've been going for a little over two hours, though at, at the stream only says 44 minutes. Hmm. Yes, I think it is about time we wrapped up. Let me just put a book. After all, we have a very happy ending to that story just now. Evil vanquished and a hero triumphant. So I think I will wrap it up here. I hope that we can do this again sometime. To be honest, I felt it was quite enjoyable. I hope everyone else enjoyed it as well. I think it is about time that we look for someone to raid. Preferably someone who is also doing ASMR. Hmm, let's see now. Raisin, Nyanulia. I think um, we're going to raid into Nainai da Possum. Possums are pretty neat. So I think that could be a fun raid. Then again, maybe, let me take a look at the category and see if there's anyone else doing some reading because I think that would be nice. Hmm.
I think I found someone interesting. All right. Selene Heidelman. <laughs> Reading the wind in the willows. Okay. Let's go say hello to Celine. But before we do that, a quick bit of housekeeping. I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight in our reading adventures. If you want, you may join the New Persian Empire through Discord, through the YouTube channel, or through Twitter. The links are now in the chat. And uh, in any case, mm -hmm. we go that should be a good raid message if you're subscribed and if you are not subscribed we'll just use this for followers now then, let's start this raid. Selene underscore Hyderman. Yes, I think that's right. All right, hum. Ah, let's try that again then. There we go. That worked. All right then. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I will see everyone tomorrow for some more Sonic Generations. That's all for now. Dismissed, soldiers. <laughs>